Okay. Don't worry. And anything like again, hello everyone, and welcome to the Systems Change Deep Dive podcast, where we are taking a systemic look at some of the greatest social, economic, and environmental challenges that we are facing as a global community, and also looking at the ideas and projects that have the potential to catalyze systems change. We are currently looking into the issue of carbon capture as a response to the climate crisis. And we have already been hearing uh, during the last episodes from experts around the world that are working on different types of approaches and solutions to carbon capture and beyond. Today, we welcome Paul Streifneder. Paul has been working as a project manager for the Pleistocene and Permafrost Foundation for almost two years now. His main responsibilities are marketing strategy, fundraising strategy, and managing the certification process. Uh, besides his work at the foundation, he's also studying business administration at the University for Applied Science in Munich. Um, welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. Hello. Good morning, guys. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm quite excited to talk about my project today. Thank you. So um, let's let's jump right into it. Um, first, I would like to kickstart this interview by asking what what led you to this work? What inspired you? What moved yeah. you to yeah. get involved in this project? Yeah, that's a good question. And my answer might be kind of boring because as you already mentioned, I, um, I study business administration here in Munich. And first of all, this program does little to have something to do with climate change or climate protection in general. But there was a module I had um, to select um, during my program, um, which focused on sustainable um, economy and green economy in general. And they basically presented us all the sort of basic surroundings like planetary boundaries, climate crisis, problem of um, capitalism and stuff like this. So really basic general. And what I saw in this module or what I found out for myself is that we are really close to the catastrophe, right? So they are really close to the 1.5 degrees um, target, for example. A lot of planetary boundaries are already really stressed out. And for, I felt like there's a lot of challenges to do, a lot of stuff to do there in this field. And I felt like it's a good potential for me to tackle this challenge and um, saw it more always saw it as a challenge for me. So that's why I got into this topic. And that's basically it. There's no really inspiration for me. That's always um, out of me. So always saw it as a challenge. I'd potential to do a lot of things. So yeah, that's why I started. Okay, so you are working with the Pleistocene Park and Pleistocene Permafrost Foundation. Um, and there is a really big park in Siberia. So could you tell us a little bit about the story of this park, how yeah. the project uh, started? Sure, yeah, yeah. So what do you have to know beforehand, before I start talking about the park, that there are right now two separate organizations. There's this organization where I work, the Pleistocene and Permafrost Foundation here in Munich. And we have a separate foundation in Russia, the Pleistocene Park Foundation. They basically um, manage the park and implement, uh, implement the park itself. And this Pleistocene Park Foundation, so the Russian foundation, was founded by the Zimovs, um, Zimov family. So there's the Sergei Zimov, that's the, that's the father, we always call him the father. Um, and he basically yeah, invented this Pleistocene concept itself. He thought about the permafrost, he thought about the mammoth steppe, and he thought about the connection between these two. So how to reestablish this mammoth step in order to protect the permafrost. And he came up with this idea basically. And then they started to implement this park. First of all, in a really small scale, obviously, try to get this like in more like, an, you can imagine it like an experiment. First of all, they tried to implement it, get some animals in the park, see how the development and saw some good results for the permafrost itself. And then they tried to expand it, got this really, um, got, as you said, really big area from the Russian government um, for scientific purposes and to do this park. So they basically own this area right now. And we try to support them with fundings, with marketing, with um, trying to get investors for this project. So that's more likely our part. And they basically focus, try to implement this park and more like the scientific side, that's their job. Okay, and could you tell us a little bit about uh, your approach to the issue of carbon capture? How does this all permafrost yeah. Yeah. Uh, place to scene idea work? 
Yeah, sure. So the Plasticine rewilding approach is really interesting because it combines a lot of things together. Karen already mentioned the um, carbon capture system. And I want to start with something else first. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is to reestablish the mammoth step biodiversity with our certain animals, big herbivores, you can imagine like bisons, reindeers, all these kind of animals that are pretty big, pretty huge, um, eat of a lot of plants and are really known to this, um, to this cold and northern environment. We basically try to re reintroduce them and recreate this biodiversity. And what this get us is that we can recreate this um, grassland that we um, had in the Pleistocene area. And this grassland is really productive. So we can imagine this like a really green, um, nice looking grassland. And this is way more productive than the vegetation that we have right now in this area. So we have a lot of carbon capture alone through this newly developed grassland. The animals that we reintroduce have two main, um, main issues surrounding the grassland itself. They work like, you can imagine them working like a landscape engineer. They um, cut down the grass. You can imagine them like a lawnmower. So they even enhance the, um, enhance the grassland even more in the carbon capture system even more. And obviously they also work like a fertilizer. So the animals are really important for the vegetation. And through this, we get this really good um, calm capture effect in our park. And furthermore, or what's most important to us that we can keep um, conserve this permafrost and keep cold the permafrost itself. But I can maybe explain it later on how this exactly works and how the animals um, do the job through with the permafrost. Yeah, I'd love to hear about that. If you could go a little sure, bit into yeah, it and sure. how it how it actually works, how you choose these animals that you that you yeah, sure. uh, release into the wild. Sure. Um, so what do you what I have to explain beforehand um, is the Pleistocene area itself. So Pleistocene area, I always talk about it. Just think about um, like it was the Ice Age, and um, that's pretty accurate. And in the Ice Age, you always saw a lot higher biodiversity in these northern areas that we have right now. So what um, these animals are um, doing is that they roam around, um, especially in winter, looking for food, um, just roam around in general. And when they do it, they destroy the snow layer. You can imagine there's a thick th uh, snow layer in, um, in winter in Siberia. If they destroy the snow layer in winter, they really destroy this insulating factor. So there's uh, soils get really warm in winter, uh, in summer. Unfortunately, we have really hot summers right now in Siberia. If you look around, it's like 38 degrees Celsius in summer in Siberia, that's crazy. And obviously the permafrost soils are getting really hot in summer. So if this um, heat stays in the winter and cannot, it cannot escape through the snow layer, it gets really problematic. So these animals are reintroduced, destroy the snow layer and the um, heat can always go through it. And we have also the positive side effect that the, in winter, it still gets really cold there in Siberia. So all this cold can go inside the soils and really make the temperature go really down in the soils. So we have seen a huge difference in temperatures there. So for example, in the park area where we reintroduce the animals, the soils go up to uh, minus 20 degrees where we see in the area where there's no um, animals and where's the, still the vegetation we saw right now, or we see right now, the um, uh, temperature gets up to minus five degrees. So there's a difference between, my, uh, between 15 degrees there. So that's crazy in our mind. And yeah, but uh, it works, so that's really good. Yes, yeah, so we have been releasing different types of animals. Um, I'm curious as to, how you how you choose these these types of the animals that you are going mm -hmm. to release and um, is there a time element to it? If you could go a little bit into that. Sure. Yeah. So um, we're trying to reintroduce animals that were um, really similar to the animals we saw in the Ice Age there. So as I mentioned beforehand, big herbivores um, that really roam around and really look for the food. So you can imagine like bisons, we really looking forward to re European bisons and also the American bison. We looking for um, reindeers, we're looking for elks and mosses. We are also looking for camels. That might be, seems like kind of strange because uh, camels, uh, camels you always imagine in the desert and something like this, but they're really, um, really good for this climate and really um, can live there. And if you look on our website, you see the pictures of the camels with this nice, 
with this nice fur and they look really sweet and fluffy and but they but they um, <laughs> they're really um good in this environment so we all look um as i said huge hairy wolves that roam around and are quite similar to the scene age um animals there and this is more likely the work of our russian team that they look for animals that are fitting and try to reintroduce them in the park yeah that's that's very interesting like uh yeah the camels <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a little yeah. bit surprising but it's interesting like it's a little bit of adaptation right like yeah, we are already yeah. things are already changing and we look for solutions that maybe weren't there in the past but they will work now um one thing that i saw on the website while preparing for for this interview today was the permafrost cave i was really curious about this so if you could maybe let out our viewers and listeners know a little bit about this uh, part of the project. Sure, yeah. yeah. So the cave, um, I think the cave itself, they um, used it beforehand as in like, an, you can imagine like a refrigerator, right? They put all this kind of fish they found uh, during the summer or during the fishing period and put it down in this cave. Um, reason is this in, in this cave, there's always um, under, um, under um, uh, zero degrees there right so always in the freezing point there because that's the characteristic of the permafrost that is always below the freezing point so can you you can really use it as a storing area as a refrigerating area and this goes really deep down in our park i think it's i don't know how deep it goes actually i'm sorry there um but um you can go there down there and see all this frozen frozen soil around you and see how it still uh, freeze down there and hopefully this um, tunnel or this um, frozen tunnel stays with us for the next period because it, it's an indicator for us how the um, soil um, how the soil works right now and how the temperature is right now in the soil so yeah hopefully it stays there and we can use it um, even in the future yeah that's really interesting um, so you already mentioned like several environmental benefits uh, of this type of approach. So um, are there more or are there any mm -hmm. eventually negative uh, side effects as well? Yeah, I can go into that. So first of all, for the positive effects, maybe um, what we can uh, or what we can achieve with this park is obviously that we also can have endangered species in our park. So for example, the European bison is right now on the endangered list. And we can obviously give them a safe and um, a nice home to stay and um, also reintroduce other endangered species eventually in our park. As I already mentioned before, and they don't have really have to do much in this park than roam around and just living their life. So I think it's pretty great for the animals itself. And obviously for us, the biggest point of this park is obviously permafrost protection. I think I don't have to mention again how important it is to protect this permafrost. It's a tipping point actually in our climate system. So it's really important to protect this um, kind of soils. Um, but you asked also about the neg negative effects. And it's um, there are actually some negative effects um, that are might seem negative, but I will try to explain it. So you might think they are positive. So right now, what you're seeing in the park is a vegetation that consists of current really wet mosses, shrub tundra. They're really small trees. And we always say, OK, we cut down these trees. We can try to convert this um, area or this vegetation into grassland. And this is one point where people say, oh, my God, they cut down trees, they destroy the vegetation and stuff like that. So this might be uh, might seem really negative that we destroy this vegetation. But if you look, it's it's object objectively, you see this this vegetation doesn't really do much for this environment. It doesn't really have a um, high carbon capture effect. It is really dark. So that means the albedo effect of this is really um, is really low. It captures a lot of um, energy and a lot of heat, and even gets it more into the ground. So what we have of this grassland, it is it's way more lighter than the vegetation that we have right now. So it also reflects way more sunlight into the atmosphere again, and is also, as I mentioned before, a way effective um, carbon capture than the vegetation that we have right now. But still, there's an, um, some sort of um, discussion and always between um, you destroy vegetation, destroy yeah, forests, which is always very bad for people to hear. So yeah, that's, that's um, our ne negative effects. 
Yeah, thank you for for honestly sharing that. Um, yeah, I don't know as a my background as I'm a biologist, so I don't see it's a form of restoration. It doesn't mean that what's there now, despite being a forest, is uh, the type of 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 ecosystem that would be the most beneficial for that yeah. area or what would be more historically um appropriate for that area i guess yeah so i can see what you mean that it's not necessarily negative um moving a little bit into the into the systems part of the interview so i would like to ask i imagine that this would be a bit difficult because um i imagine the part being quite in a remote area to be able to have all of these animals but if, is there any integration with other economic activities mm -hmm. maybe i don't know some tourism in the area mm -hmm. that's a, a great question about tourism so we thought about it um, at the at the beginning um when we tried to work with the russians so because this tourism might be in quite interesting way to get more funding right that's our, always our main goal um to get the funding going to get a sustainable way of funding but um, as you already mentioned, Caroline, this park is in a really remote area and to get this area is always the hardest part and is a really complicated story. So um, we settled it and said, okay, it's COVID, it's Corona, so there's no chance to really get someone in this park outside of um, scientific workers and journalists a little bit. So um, that's where we settled and said, maybe look into the future again. What we try to incorporate is obviously um, the reindeer breeders around the area. We always have to get um, our animals from them and they work with our Russian partners a lot. Also with um, people, you, there's a small little town um, right next to the park called Chersky, around 2000 people maybe. It was a way larger area, a way larger um, village um, 10 to 20 years ago it was a mining village. But they um, but they lost it, so there's no really mining work going on right now. Um, but we try to incorporate a lot of workers there in the park, for example, like rangers or stuff, or just people that are looking um, at the park and looking at the infrastructure, maintain the infrastructure. So we always try to incorporate them. But there's no really incorporation of um, indigenous people, for example. But we try to look at it in the future when we try to expand the park, try to expand to new areas. We really um, like to look at where are areas where there's no one, probably, but also look at areas where maybe a settlement is or maybe an indigenous group is that they might work for this park and might um, work around the park because it always has obviously some benefits for them as well, like um, like soils that are not thawing under their feet. So that's obviously really good for their infrastructure at the end of the day. So we try to incorporate them in the future way more. Yeah, so it's interesting that you, that you mentioned this small village. Um, so would you say that the park being there has kind of affected their well-being, maybe by providing some jobs, maybe some activity to the area? Yeah, What's your perception? Yeah. So as you said, also, um, obviously, some jobs are um, always created by this park. You have to maintain the infrastructure. You have to look out for the animals. You have to ship around the animals, like transporting stuff and stuff like this. Um, but um, that's just only for us the economy, economic factor that's really important here on a side like um, that they really get a benefit from the power for protection itself. I think we have to expand the project way more that we really see a benefit there that they say, OK, our soils around our area are way more um, stable, for example, in other areas. That's a part that we might see in the future, but right now we can't really say that's the benefit for them, just as an maybe in an economic way that we create new jobs, but that's it right now. Okay, you also mentioned uh, that you have scientific uh, scientists visiting the park, so is there an educational uh, component to your activities? Yeah. Um, that's a good question because for me um, as well, they, I really didn't know about permafrost before I started working here. And I think a lot, um, few people know about the permafrost right now. I'm um, just in my opinion, and even fewer people know probably about the Pleistocene Park, I'm guessing. So we really want to um, create more awareness around the park and create more awareness around the permafrost and even create more awareness around rewilding approaches in general, because I'm thinking that's a really nice solution to the climate change, um, these nature-based uh, solutions. 
so we try to right now we try to um post a lot of stuff on social media and really get the, our edu education away there in less things like instagram things like twitter also there's a lot of um journalism going around the park and journalism around um plasticine concepts so we try always try to share these kind of videos and get them more attention to these videos because we always see when there's a good new reportage about the park itself um, our donations go up, our funding is way more easier and it's way more easier to convince people that it's a good, um, gets a good project when you see these kind of um, kind of films and kind of retroplays. But um, right now, there's not much more going on from our side than just social media posts and trying to get people there in touch with us. So that's it where we are right now. Okay, and uh, yeah, also you you mentioned this kind of ties in a little bit with other with with my next question. So you you mentioned the rewilding approach in general, um, and I I wanted to ask: Are you working with other groups that are rewilding in Europe? And this kind of mm -hmm. ties in with the question of how scalable do you think this is? How easily could it be applied in other locations? Mm -hmm. I know that it's already being applied in some other places, but yeah. maybe you could. Let us know a little bit more about the actual scale of what's happening sure, worldwide yeah. or in Europe. Sure. Um, first of all, maybe um, w which partners we work right now um, regarding the rewilding sense. Um, we try to re uh, work with Rewilding Europe. Unfortunately, we only try to focus on Rewilding Europe. So that's really out of the scope of this um, organization. Um, another organization that we approached and um, tried to work with them in the future, we had a, some calls with them, is the Rewild. Um, that's the former um, Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. And they try to really focus on rewilding. And in general, um, if you look on their website, you always see only project in the southern um, a sphere of the globe. So they always focus on the tropical rewilding stuff, but they told us they want to um, really focus on other rewilding areas like in the north, like in the um, yeah, more northern parts of the globe. So we try to work with them because in order to scale our project, there's one, um, yeah, one main challenge that we have to tackle is that we have a really sustainable way of um, getting the, all these animals. There's a huge demand of animals um, in the future when we try to expand this park. So we have to really find a um, good way to get these animals really quick in the park and in a really yeah high numbers. Um, so this is really hard to do, um, figure out how to breed these animals in the right way that we get them most quickly in the park, not stress them out too much, these animals. And so in order that we can expand the area. So because the um, expansion potential of this project is really big. So if you look at the climate or say climate relevant permafrost soils, these are really specific soils and specific areas where a lot of carbon is stored, these so-called Yodoma areas. And this Yodoma areas, as I mentioned, do you find them the most carbon in it? And this area stretches, uh, stretches around, I think I've noted down 1.4 million square kilometers. And it's mostly in, uh, in Russia, in Siberia, but there's also some parts in Alaska, Canada. And we really try to focus on these areas, on these Yodoma areas to rewild these areas and to get our animals um, on these areas and protect these areas because they are most climate relevant. Um, and some numbers for you guys, um, if you're interested, if you, when we achieve to um, really um, expand our whole project or whole concept or these kind of areas, there's a potential of a calm capture effect um, way above one um, gigaton, so one uh, billion tons per year actually. And right now, what we find in this um, in these areas is about 400 million tons of carbon st is still stored in this area. And we always obviously have to or want to protect this um, kind of carbon and avoid this emission of these areas. This is our main goal and not focus on the whole permafrost. Might be a little bit, the Euroma area is still a little bit big, but if you look at permafrost in general, it's even bigger. So, but this is our main focus right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and again, explaining honestly about the challenges and the benefits. Uh, really interesting to hear about the potential in those numbers, because that's a really big number. That's huge. That's yeah, exciting. That's huge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this um, as we're moving towards the end of, of the interview. So after this uh, impressive number, would you say that you are 
kind of hopeful about the 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 climate and carbon crisis i actually am really optimistic and hopeful still um, that might be because I'm still young and literally working a long time in this area. But I've, as I said, I'm still hopeful, um, even though I know mankind um, actually destroyed a lot um, and already ruined a lot of this planet. But I'm still really optimistic that there are still people um, with huge potential that um, create new solutions, that create new ways of finding these solutions. And I feel like, especially in my generation and probably in the generation after me um, as well, there's a lot of uh, awareness surrounding climate, um, the climate crisis. There's so many smart people. And I feel like if these smart people really focus on this crisis, it should be no issue to solve this crisis, in my opinion. So I'm looking forward to it. And I will be working in this field for many years, see what's going on. And probably there's still few, few people or some new people that will work in this um, area and I'm quite hopeful and quite optimistic that we'll that we will achieve this crisis or will tackle this crisis and that <laughs> will work out at the end that's my opinion there great so with this kind of hopeful mindset if people watching um, are kind of inspired and interested in this type of project um, what would you recommend that they can do to support the cause or potentially get involved in in projects like this sure. yeah sure so when you want to support our project there's always obviously the donation button on our website that's the easiest way but probably the most boring way in my opinion we're always looking for volunteer support um for example we have a volunteer um storytelling um woman for us that helps really with creating nice text passage and really nice wording and stuff like this because our team is quite small and we don't have much time to work on these um, stuff like that. So if you, if you have a nice skill, like, I don't know, every skill um, is always needed in our organization. And if you have some time sparing, I don't know, you can always voluntarily work with us or even make an internship, um, apply for other jobs here. Um, that's always possible. Um, but I feel like if you already uh, or, or just want to share some stuff up around our social media, share some reportage around uh, permafrost, create a little bit more awareness around, surrounding this problem, it always helps us out a lot. And this is probably enough to do so. Yeah. OK, great. Those are very actionable points. Uh, thank you so much, Paul, for being here today, for sharing so much about this really interesting, really out, let's say, out of the box project. Um, yeah, and for those of you who are watching, uh, you can head on over to the description to find the links to the Place to Scene Park website and to the social media where you can share and potentially reach out to get involved with, with this really uh, important mission and to work a little bit and learn a little bit more about the permafrost. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great time.